I have a very peculiar job, and I think it's very peculiar that I'm sitting on a panel talking about uh, competition. Uh, it's perhaps useful to think of the CPUC as a, a, a um, financing structure for infrastructure, particularly centralized infrastructure. And so uh, a good example is our, our early days as the Railroad Commission, where it became clear that you had competition between rail providers to big markets, but no service elsewhere in the state of California. And there were so many people competing for transportation services between LA and San Francisco, for example, that everybody was going bankrupt. So the solution was to create an agency that awarded a franchise to one sim single operator and then uh, made sure that they were charging fair rates that didn't gouge, but that actually made sure that investors were sure that they would be paid back. And so we, we do that by setting those rates at the cost of the infrastructure plus a fair return. And so when the electric industry started to come along and the telecom industry came along, they said, that's what we need. We had examples of, uh, of competing electric companies in, in major California cities where you had two, maybe three sets of poles on opposite sides of the street and people picking off customers on the opposite sides of the street and, and wires just everywhere. And so this franchising system cleaned up the industries, if you look at the literature and the legal, um, the legislative debate at the time that the CPUC was established, very prominent was this concept of, of calamitous or ruinous competition. And we were, we were designed to kill competition in the interest of getting cheap capital, because lenders were pretty sure they were going to get repaid, and then build in the infrastructure quickly, a lot of money up front for this very, very, very large, uh, expensive infrastructure. So in, in many respects, it's been pretty successful. Um, the, the, the challenge, of course, is that we're now in an era where there are a lot of new technologies that, that actually can replace some of those centralized functions. And you've seen it in the, in the telecom industry where people basically don't need the same kind of services from a dominant utility. There's actually competition between different providers. So what the hell do we do, given our design, when you start to see competition coming forward? What is, how do we actually operate and, uh, as, as a regulator? And how do we ensure that the infrastructure is still there that it's operated safely, that it's operated at a reasonable cost when you start to see these competitive uh, tools coming into the marketplace. And uh, there are a few things that we've done. For the last, since 1996, we have not allowed the utilities to own new generating facilities. We did go a little further around 2000, 2001, and try to actually allow retail competition for customers using the, the last piece of, of true natural monopoly infrastructure, which is the wires, didn't work very well. There are still scars all over the state of California about that. Um, but we do see competition. We're also able to condition the utilities procurement in ways that have been very helpful. So as we were starting to focus on grinding carbon out of the electric industry, we started to order them to procure from a narrow range of what we call renewable technologies. In California, that does not include hydro as it does in most other states and countries, um, simply because we were trying to force investment in specific technologies, wind, solar, um, to some extent geothermal, biomass. And so then you have to then look at the our renewable portfolio standard, the requirement that utilities provide 33% of their electricity from this narrow range of technologies. Not so much simply as an effort to clean up our electric system, but as an industrial policy. 
designed to force investment in, and bring to market scale technologies that weren't really present in California. It's been very successful. Between 2009 and two th the end of 2012, we issued permits, we cited issued permits and, and, and built in the interconnection infrastructure for 150 large renewable energy projects over 100 megawatts. And so that, that actually in turn created jobs, it's, uh, it's, it's built a cadre of developers. We did that through a competitive uh, uh, bake-off between those companies who were seeking to get contracts with the utilities. Um, and then we reviewed the contracts to make sure that they hit the, 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 the general price range given the fact that you need to meet certain kinds of electrical needs. So to some extent, we've learned how to deal with, with innovation in a very clumsy second step way. But as a result of the success of this renewable portfolio standard, which brought the, the solar PV industry to scale very quickly, we're actually starting to see even more innovation and a new kind of phenomenon. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the convergences, but as people actually are able to buy their own um, uh, solar photovoltaics and they aren't so dependent on central station power, that's changing the dynamic. All of a sudden, there's stress on all of the central purchasing facilities. The utilities help to fund it simply because they actually buy the excess electricity from these rooftop arrays. But it's really about customers and, and individual consumers now starting to get engaged in making decisions. We don't have retail functions at the CPUC. We deal with fairly centralized infrastructure. So this challenge of dealing with innovation and competitive processes even becomes greater. So I'll just point to even a couple of other confounding challenges that, that we're starting to see in terms of convergence. Currently, only 20% of the carbon that's released into the environment in the state of California comes from the electric utilities. We've actually been very successful. 30% comes from the use of natural gas in buildings, largely for heating, cooking, and cooling. We don't have an RPS for gas. As a matter of fact, nobody talks about it. Everybody talks about the electric system. Everybody wants to spend ratepayer dollars to perfect the electric system. We haven't moved on to gas. If you want to fix Aliso Canyon, then you need to make everybody in the LA Basin get rid of their gas water heaters, their gas stoves, and start to move to electric stoves that are actually and water heaters or solar water heaters that will displace the use of gas. If you look at Aliso Canyon, 60% of the winter use goes to heating people's homes and cooking their food. You can grind everything you can out of the electric industry, but that's not going to solve that. The other 40% chunk of our, of our carbon uh, loading actually comes from transportation. If we want to meet our 2030 and 2050 goals, electric fuels have to begin to displace the gas in the petroleum industry in daily life in California. That's a big transition, and you can't get there simply through the RPS. The RPS is a way to clean up the electric grid, but it ultimately can't help to address our, our, our larger goals. The other, the other thing that I see, the, a convergence that I think is a challenge for, for everybody to think about is that wooden poles are actually becoming the most intelligent and most dynamic part of our electric system. They carry more data and more intelligence than any other part of our infrastructure. They carry fiber for cable. They carry plain old telephone system. They carry uh, uh, VIOS and VoIP. And now they're starting to carry the, the latest in wireless broadband, as well as electricity. They are a conveyance that every other industry is using. 
as a result of this, the utilities who've built a lot of, uh, of uh, backhaul for their smart meters are starting to think about getting into telecommunications in an unregulated space. Thank you, Reed.